people. All right, we're going to begin right now, so let's take our seats, please. Okay. All right, everybody, welcome back from break. Now for our final panel of the day on a very critical topic, mental health and substance use. I'm happy to introduce the youth participating on this panel. First, Jalen Harvey. Jalen Harvey is an enrolled member of the Navajo Nation, a descendant of the Pueblo of Acoma, and affiliates herself with the Hopi tribe. Jalen is a recent graduate from Sunny Slope High School, where she graduated with an advanced diploma. She is a freshman at the University of Arizona, where she is majoring in business management and working on a double minor in American Indian Studies and Leadership. Along with holding her responsibilities with Unity, she has also been an active member for the past four consecutive years with the Future Inspired Native American Leaders Youth Council at the Phoenix Indian Center, where she holds the positions of community service co-chairperson, executive vice president, and the executive president. Next, we have Shayla Tilson Lafferty. Ms. Lafferty is an Ogallala and Miniconju Lakota youth. She comes from a long lineage of freedom fighters. Since a young child, she's been in the movement fighting for the water, land, and her people. As she's gotten older, she's continued to advocate and proudly uses her voice. Next, we have Jasmine Wildcat. Jasmine Wildcat has spent most of her formative years advocating for equality and equity for others and ensuring that humankind and the earth will be, be protected for future generations. She is an advocate for gun control, inclusion, equal rights, the environment, voting rights, MMIP, and the, the stigmatization of mental illness. I will now pass it over to Jalen to introduce our two federal panelists joining us today. Hello, everybody. Uh, as Autumn noted, this is a critical topic for all of us, and we have two federal leaders in the fields of mental health and substance abuse used to discuss these issues with us, who I will now introduce. Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration Assistant Secretary Miriam Delf Delfin Rittman. Dr. D Miriam E. Delfin Rittman is currently Assistant Secretary for Mental Health and Substance Use in the U U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Administrator of the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. She previously served as commissioner of the Connecticut Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services and served in this role for six years. Prior positions held at DMHAS include deputy commissioner, senior policy advisor, and director of the department's Office of Multicultural Healthcare Equity. In her role as commissioner, Dr. Delphin Rittman was committed to promoting recovery-oriented, integrated, and culturally responsive services and systems that foster dignity, respect, and meaningful community inclusion. Prior to her current appointment, Dr. Delphin Rittman was an adjunct associate professor at Yale University, where she served on faculty for the past 20 years. While at Yale, Dr. Delphin Rittman served as the Director of Cultural Competence and Re Research Consultation with the Yale University Program for Recovery and Community Health. In May 2014, Dr. Delphin Rittman completed a two-year White House appointment working as a senior advisor to the administrator of the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. With the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, while at SAMHSA, she worked on a range of policy initiatives addressing behavioral health equity, workforce development, and healthcare reform. 
Through her 20-year career in the, her behavioral health field, Dr. Delphin Rittman has extensive experience in the design, evaluation, and administration of mental health, substance use, and prevention services and systems, and has received several awards for advancing policy in these areas. Most recently, she received the 2019 State Service Award from the National Association of State... We love our scripts here of Drug and Alcohol Directors and the 2016 Mental Health Award for Excellence from the United Nations Committee on Mental Health. She received her Bachelor of Arts in a Social Science from Hofstra University in 1989, her Master's and PhD in Clinical Psychology from Purdue University, 1992 and 2001 respectively, and completed a postdoctoral fellowship in clinical community psychology at Yale University in 2002. For our next federal leader, Beth Connolly, Assistant Director of Public Health, White House Office of National Drug Control Policy. Beth Connolly serves as the Assistant Director of the Office of Public Health within the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy. In this role, Ms. Connolly oversees the development and implementation of public health approaches to reducing drug use and its consequences, consequences focusing on prevention, harm reduction, treatment, workforce, and recovery-ready workplaces, and recovery support services. Ms. Connolly brings to ONDCP decades of public health and human services experience in both government and nonprofit sectors. Beth served for 30 years in the New Jersey Department of Human Services Concluding her state government career of department's commissioner, her government experience includes serving people who are often underrepresented and face social challenges such as homelessness and a lack of health care. During her tenure, she shepherded re reforms related to behavioral Medicaid and its expansion safety net programs, child welfare, and the adoption of home and community-based services. After leaving state government, Ms. Connolly joined the Pew Charitable Trust there, she directed the Substance Use Prevention and Treatment Initiative, leading research and technical assistance efforts across the federal government and states to promote evidence-based transformation of the treatment system, expand the substance use disorder workforce, optimize coverage and reimbursement for effective treatment, and improve the delivery and coordination of care for underserved populations. Ms. Connolly had served as an adjunct professor in graduate programs at Seton Hall University, Rutgers University and Georgetown University. Beth holds a bachelor's degree in social work and a master in public administration, both from Seton Hall University. I'd like to now hand it over to Shayla to ask our first question. The first question I have is, um, what are the systems around us doing to support our mental health as indigenous youth? Um, and also, I've, I've looked into the Counselors Not Criminalization Act um, and I guess, why is it that we have more SROs uh, than counselors in schools? I believe that having someone to process your feelings with, especially as a young indigenous youth um, living in the circumstances that we have to coming up, um, what are the systems around us doing to support us? I guess I'm gonna let Dr. Delphine Rittman start with that for um, her SAMHSA perspective. Yeah, yeah it's such an important question. And I love that you framed it in terms of, you know, what are the systems? Um, because often we know taking a system of care approach is so critical because we know young people touch many different systems. And so um, I'll speak from the sort of behavioral health from the SAMHSA lane. And, and so some of what we really work to do at SAMHSA is to, uh, you know, take a system of care approach, but really think about what are some of the critical services and supports that would be helpful to have within that system. Um, and then we'll often put together grant programs uh, to address a broad range of needs uh, it, when we identify any gaps or any, any need areas. Um, so one grant in particular that does give grantees, uh, particularly within, actually it's a grant just for Native communities, um, is our Native Connections grant. Um, and the thing I love about Native Connections is it is for uh, um, tribal communities uh, to address the needs of young people from uh, youth up to age 24. Uh, and it's to be able to put sort of services and supports in place to be able to address any mental health related needs, any substance use related needs, uh, or even suicide you know, related uh, challenges that the youth or even families within the community may have, may be experiencing. Um, and so the wonderful other thing about the grant is that it also does allow for, and we really encourage 
um, the incorporation of traditional practices. Uh, because we know, and what we've heard as we do site visits and others, is that culture is healing. Um, that culture is healing, and so it's so important to be able to incorporate traditional practices, uh, and that is allowable within this particular funding um, initiative. Uh, and so when we go, as we've talked with grantees, and I've, as I've had the opportunity to visit grantees across the country, it's been wonderful to see in which, the ways in which some of those traditional and really creative practices are incorporated into the grant. So for example, um, the Seychellis, and I, I'm going to make sure I'm pronouncing that right, uh, but the uh, you know, Chehalis uh, Tribal Council. Um, so they have a grant in which they are, and again, it's, it's part of the um, Native Connections, um, where they bring young people and work with young people, and they go um, on hikes and walking. And as part of that process, they identify traditional plants and herbs that are used for traditional medicine and also for um, healing. Uh, and then, uh, and so the young people learn about that, and so it's a way to connect them to their culture and connect them to healthy healing um, strategies. And so that's just one example. Another one, real quick, that I'll share is um, our, and I want to make sure I'm getting the pronunci pronunciation right, um, the Muckleshoot. Uh, so the Muckleshoot Indian tribe, and we had the opportunity to visit them as well, um, has implemented an overdose prevention, uh, you know, strategy in, in which, and reversal campaign in which they're doing a broad range of tree t teaching and training and education. But again, incorporating the cultural practices, they'll sometimes incorporate and do some of that training and teaching, for example, on um, canoe journeys uh, or during other traditional practices, uh, you know, cultural dinners. Um, and it's just a way, again, to be able to incorporate culture into the health and healing practice, uh, health and healing process, um, but again, filling in gaps within a system of care because typically we don't necessarily see that within a system of care. And so our, our grant allows for um, flexibility to be able to address some of those behavioral health needs within a system. Um, I agree how culture is very important. I think that it should be all you know intertwined. Um, our second question will be for Assistant Director Connolly. Um, how is the Office of National Control Policy supporting recovery for youth and young adults, uh, especially as they enter the workforce? Thank you so much, and it's been really wonderful, wonderful being here uh, with all of you today. I had the opportunity to get here a little early, and um, I was really enjoying and really learning a lot from listening to all of you. So let me move this down. Because, oh, there we go. Um, so we um, have, are seeing right across, yes, that really uh, drug use and overdose deaths are really taking a toll on our youth, um, our you know adolescents, high school, and, and college-age students who may be experimenting um, with substances for any number of reasons um, and aren't aware of the lethality of the drug supply right now. And so it's really important that we do reach out and we make sure that we are um, addressing folks' needs where they are in their communities. Um, and as Dr. Delphi Rittman said, we have a number of programs also through ONDCP that really looks at um, each community. Uh, we have drug-free community grants. Um, and programs where we fund the communities to come together and figure out what is the right approach for their community. So it's not a cookie cutter. We're not telling everybody they have to be exactly the same because we even know, um, you know, folks in like nearby communities, they all need different and very specific culturally competent services. So that's one way that we're addressing, you know, through our young people. Um, another is we're doing campaigns um, to attract um, our older youth, um, and these are through social influencers. Um, and uh, I, I bring my prop with me all the time. Um, you all can save lives um, through using uh, and carrying Narcan, Naloxone with you. Um, it's available over the counter. You can get it at, the, um, at your drugstore, at your, uh, your big box store. Um, and it's really important, and so we're doing an influencer community, um, and I'm too old to understand exactly how it works, but I know that we have a lot of folks that we go out and make sure that they can reach particular communities by sending the message about the lethality of the drug supply and that naloxone can save lives. So we're trying to reach folks in that way using tools that we know that would resonate. In terms of what we're doing for folks in recovery, uh, we're really building a continuum. So starting with folks in high school, 
um, really supporting recovery high schools where folks can go with other young people in recovery and have a learning environment that helps them and supports them. The same thing as folks get to college, and I've been listening to where everybody's going in all your majors and your minors, and I'm in awe of all the work you must be doing, um, but also to create uh, recovery communities at the college level so that folks, again, are supported so they can have a really successful college term. Um, and we have just finished with our um, peers at the Department of Labor uh, creating a recovery-ready workplace website so that employers, as you're all leaving college um, and you've had this great experience and you're going out to do amazing things, that you can have an employer um, and a good employment experience so that, again, folks are supported in the workplace. And a lot of this has to do to reducing stigma, our words matter, um, and making sure that people are supported and held up in the workplace. So really going from you know, our, our smallest folks up to folks that are in the workforce. Thank you to both of you for those answers. You know, it's really, it's really amazing what you, the work you guys are doing for not only indigenous communities, but the whole nation. So I would just like to ask the rest of our panel, um, what helps you with your mental health? Do you have anything you would like to share with any, everyone here on what works for you? I didn't introduce myself earlier. My name is Shayla Tilson Lafferty. I'm Oglala, Mini Koji Lakota. Um, and something that, that really helps with my mental health and has is being bored by myself, spending time by myself, learning to, um, I think sometimes, especially in, in this day and age, this generation has a whole different landscape. You know, we have the option to get on our phone and, and avoid these things, you know, so really taking that time to sit in silence and to get to know yourself, dig deep, um, try to understand yourself, learn to understand yourself and even the parts of yourself that um, are challenging or frustrating or why did I do this? But having grace for yourself in those moments too, um, allowing yourself to be patient with yourself. Um, I, I'm just really inspired as well to see so many indigenous youth from everywhere here um, doing amazing work. And um, I know there can be times where we might doubt ourselves, but um, I'm really proud of each and every single one of you. Um, and don't be afraid to have grace with yourself. It's good to, it's good to be passionate about what you do and to keep going and to hustle, you know. Um, but take that time by yourself to, to get to know yourself and um, to be patient with yourself and everything that you do. Um, so I think that's something that's really, really helped my mental health and connecting with myself, um, connecting with my culture as well. I think it's something that's always been present in my life, but. Um, I think when you come, when you go through things in life and then reapproach things with a healing perspective, then you know things you might have been surrounded around your whole life um, that seemed like, oh, well, that's just you know going to ceremony or something. But um, viewing it from a healing perspective and seeing it as it's not just going to ceremony; it's feeding my spirit and feeding my mind. Um, those things. So I, I encourage you all to to connect with yourself to feed your spirit, pray with yourself, sing those songs, learn them. Um, I encourage you to connect with your mind, do things that stimulate your mind, that feel good to your, to your, your chante and your heart and your nari, your, your, your spirit. Um, yeah, I encourage you all to do that. Those need to end on the NNL, Jasmine Wildcat, not in and So, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Jasmine Wildcat. I'm an enrolled member of the Northern Apple Tribe. Um, I am currently a third year student at the University of Wyoming, where I'm triple majoring in psychology, Native American and Indigenous Studies, and political science. Uh, <laughs> um, and then for me, um, in terms of, of coping, um, what works for me, like just a disclaimer, what works for me may not work for everyone else because there's no one size fits all, like there's no cookie cutter solution to, to this. Um, but I just find that 
that just speaking about mental health and really just educating others um, really, really helps me because I think um, that you know, more, the more education and the more awareness that we, that we get out about mental health and how it's okay to not be okay, you know, really just, it really just makes me feel good. Um, the, you know, the it's okay to lay in bed some days. Yeah, I agree. I, I do it more than I should, but it does make me feel good. <laughs> Um, and that, you know, I think that we really just need to, to make it more, a more comfortable conversation, um, that, uh, that it's okay to be feeling this way and that, um, really just, just, you know, really just starting the conversation to, to make it more, you know, like I said, comfortable. Um, and, um, there's something else I was going to say, um. Come find me afterwards, and we can talk more. <laughs> but that's about it. Thank you both. Can we get a round of applause for these two? <laughs> and like Jasmine said, you know, what we say works best for us. It might not work best for you guys. Because, you know, I'm pretty sure you all have your own way of, you know, coping with your mental health. Um, personally, for me, um, one of my favorite things is journaling. I learned um, how to journal from a friend I consider my sister, Samaya Kitogwa. Um, it just kind of made me like able to express my feelings with writing and you know, just be able to express how I feel without having to feel judged by, you know, if I were to tell somebody. Um, and you know, if I were to tell you guys anything, it would probably be, you know, your mental health matters, you know, your self-care, you know, go, you know. Buy something, you know, if it makes you feel better, you know, go buy, you know, even if it's expensive, you know, if it makes you feel better, then do it. <laughs> and, or, you know, just buying that coffee every day, you know, that helps a lot. So, you know, just whatever works best for you, you know, keep on doing it. Don't, like, feel like you can't express how you feel truthfully and honestly. So thank you, guys. Um, yeah, so uh, we're, we're now going to be... <laughs> we are now going to be moving into a group discussion on mental health. In your folders, you will see questions to guide your discussion. Each table will need a table leader to guide the discussion and to write down key thoughts, and those that want to share out to the whole group will be able to at the end of our discussion. There will be staff available to assist you if you have any questions. So get started. <laughs> We will have about the next 20 minutes to discuss and answer the questions. Then we'll come back together to hear from as many tables as we can in our remaining time. So we're going to have, um, thank you for having discussion about this important issue. Now we could look. Would you read it? Hey everyone, we just wanted to recognize um, that, you know, we, these may have been heavy conversations that, you know, we just have, but we find it very important to sort of have these in more of like a healthy setting to, to just destigmatize um, these conversations. Um, and then we just wanted to know if y'all have any questions. So if you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand. Are there any questions by chance? Hi, so um, I just kind of wanted to like talk about, I don't know if this is necessarily like a question, but um, so I went to a university where like, you know, alcohol use was like really big. Like there's a huge party culture. Um, if anyone's from the Midwest, um, and knows the term unofficial. It's like unofficial St. Patrick's Day. It's a huge thing. And um, so I guess kind of what my thinking was is how do you encourage um, or discourage substance abuse among kind of older youth like in your like late teens and early 20s just because I think it's really normalized in college to like drink all weekend like th starting Thursday and going through Sunday. So 
You know, one thing is to have folks talking about, you know, the health and well-being of people. Um, and as we look at the research, you know, trying to um, shame people doesn't work. Um, trying to do like a scared straight kind of approach doesn't usually work. But what we're finding in hearing is that more about talking to people about their health and well-being really has started to be better. But we need more people to do that. Um, and some folks are nervous, like, right? You, nobody wants to like, be the first one to speak. Nobody may want to be the first one to talk to folks. But if you can start with a few people and find folks that, you know, in, in terms of like, um, thinking about a recovery-oriented community, um, but people who are willing to like, work together to then reach out. Um, you know, we talk a lot about, um, I have a person who works with me, and um, prevention among young adults is really one of her focuses, is really trying to figure out like what is, how can we best approach them and who are the best messengers. And so we often need people who are peers to be these messengers because um, there's a lot of folks that don't wanna listen to, the, to their professors or to the other people on campus that are adults. Um, and so if we can create peer groups, peer groups can be very successful in helping people sort of redirect this energy into something that can be um, even better for them. Dr. Duffin Mittman? Yeah, and, and so one thing that we do at SAMHSA, so again, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, it's one of those long acronyms, <laughs> but the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration is through our, our Center for Substance Use Prevention. Um, we fund community coalitions, and one of the things that the community coalitions do is they do um, trainings within school and un university settings around sort of raising awareness um, around the dangers of substance or the substance use or the challenges uh, and around uh, substance use that, that a youth or even a community may experience. Um, another thing we have is an app that we call uh, Talk They Hear You, and it's an app that school personnel can download to, inclu to include individuals on college campuses or parents um, or even community members. Um, and it has important conversation starters around having conversations with a young person uh, around substance use. Um, you know, so things like, oh, you know, I, I, I see you might be struggling or, you know, I see. So just, you know, conversation starters and then it also has vignettes uh, around and videos around starting some of these conversations to ultimately raise awareness um, and begin to open up sort of windows of opportunity for discussion. Um, around young people who may be struggling or using substances. So that's just one example. Um, but we see quite a bit of creative work happening across college campuses, um, funded either through our Substance Use Block Grant um, or funded through, because that there's a prevention sort of resources within that, um, or within uh, grants funded by our, our Center for Substance Use Prevention. Um, I just want to kind of touch touch basis with like mental health. Both of my parents are psychologists for Indian country and have like participated on um, boards surrounding uh, indigenous people and psych. And um, what I've noticed through like what my parents do and like the work that they contribute to our community. Um, like I'm gonna speak from my, my father's perspective on this one time, I actually went into a community with him um, at Fort Belknap Reservation located in Montana during COVID, um, their suicide rates amongst, amongst youth were very high and uh, he went out into the field to visit with the family, you know, put himself in that environment. And that's not the normal, you know, that's not at all when you take the perspective of Western colonial mental health approaches, but then like you wanna go back to our cultural teachings and our holistic approaches. Um, for the longest time that wasn't welcome you know like having um, more of a traditional or even like a cultural outlet perspective be welcomed into these western colonial spaces and so like my question is how can we nurture our these western colonial mental health spaces to being more inviting to our indigenous people and psych because there was a time when um the even the national committee said that indigenous people weren't welcome into psych you know like that we we didn't belong in this world of mental health when we are mental health i go back to our culture really saving us saving our people 
through genocide, through the boarding school era, you know, like even now, um, culture is needed more than ever, especially in our youth when uh, through COVID, you know, we didn't have those outlets. And I, I guess like going back to my question is how can we, we open these spaces to our culture and, but not in a way that exploits us, but in a way that, that uplifts us. Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah you know, it, it makes total sense. And it's such an important question. Um, and so certainly it is one area that uh, the SAMHSA that we're working at, but even across, I would say across HHS, um, it, I think it, some of what you're talking about is addressing equity. How do we address equity and in incorporating culture uh, and cultural traditions and people's worldview and beliefs and values into the services and supports um, that we fund? How do we make those, those services and supports culturally responsive and culturally congruent and culturally competent? Um, and so one of the things that we do at SAMHSA is, you know, within our grants, we encourage uh, and we have language in there that it is entirely appropriate um, to incorporate cultural traditions um, along with other practices that might be proposed. Um, and one thing that I love in my role is I've gotten to, and I really feel it's such a privilege really, but is I've been able to visit, um, you know, different community programs uh, on, on reservations and elsewhere across the country. Um, I, I love seeing that mixing of cultural practices and other practices that, that, uh, that people are proposing, because it does make a difference. We know that culture is healing. Um, we know that culture is healing and community, creating community spaces is healing. Um, and so it's been wonderful just to see some examples of that. Um, you know, sweat lodges uh, within, you know, as part of a, a community program, um, or talking circles or canoe journeys. Um, and just a range of, tra of traditions that are, that, um, are healing and, and that uh, it's important for us to continue to support. Um, but thank you for that question. And it sounds like for the amazing work that your parents are doing because uh, it is important, I think, to, to work from a culturally um, responsive lens and perspective. It was like never welcomed, you know, like even in our own community that, that other indigenous psychologists are coming up and like learning to navigate their their skills and how to integrate that into their work and so like we're, we're well at least i'm seeing firsthand is that like now more people are becoming more open to that and like welcoming that because we are seeing the results we see the physical results we see the statistics we see mm -hmm. all the information in there and so i just hope that like that's more advocated for on like more of um a national spectrum mm -hmm. thank you thank you for that Um, all right, we're going to open it up to um, hear from a few tables. Um, so if you would like to share about what you guys talked about um, in your um, little group discussions, raise your hands. I think it's on. Yeah. Should we? Should we go? Should we go somewhere else first? Should we come back? Should we go somewhere yeah, else yeah, we'll come back. Watson. Hablaré desde el español. En un seguida, en seguida les traduce. Bueno, en esta mesa compartimos varias cosas. Eh, desde la, los compañeros que trabajan eh, o van como a ceremonias de sus propios pueblos, eh, compañeras que han estado ahí en, en busca como de su, de, su, eh, como de, de su propia identidad. Algo que me llamó mucho la atención, que ya fue como el último, fue como el sentido de pertenencia. Eso es muy importante que no lo perdamos como jóvenes, el sentido de pertenencia pertenecemos a una comunidad y esa comunidad es la que nos alienta como a seguir. Eh, varias eh, compañeras hacían como su propia eh, opinión, eh, compartían como sus sentires y eso es como el abrirnos también. Eh, decía, eh, comentaba mucho que eh, daba eh, 
doy clases eh, de filosofía indígena en una preparatoria y trabajo constantemente con jóvenes, jóvenes que están entre los 15 y los 18 años y tienen como muchas inseguridades, porque uno atraviesa como en esa parte de no saber eh, eh, dónde pertenecer. Porque estás, eh, hace rato, justo cuando estaba como participando en, el, en, 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 el, en la mesa de enfrente, mencionaba mucho como esta parte de, de estamos viviendo entre los dos mundos y es fácil perdernos, es fácil perderte en, ese, en esos dos mundos porque no sabes ni a dónde perteneces. Pero este sentido de pertenencia es vital para nosotros, seamos Lakota, somos eh, navajos, seamos centales, seamos chochiles, nahuas, totonacos, todos los pueblos que existen, somos, eh, tenemos que te tener eso en mente, que pertenecemos y venimos de ahí, y que eso es lo que nos va a cubrir. Le decía hace rato que entre lo individual está lo comunitario y lo comunitario es individual. Entonces, esta perspectiva es muy importante porque si yo estoy mal, mi comunidad también va a estar mal. Y si mi comunidad está mal, yo también estoy mal como internamente. Hay una palabra en náhuatl que dice amo y yo olfacto, como no estoy bien desde el corazón. Y eso es como muy importante porque tenemos que curar eso y hacerlo desde nuestra propia cultura. Tenía también este cuestionamiento de cómo mediar esta situación entre... En la, en la psicología occidental, pero también los conocimientos de nuestros pueblos, porque hace rato lo mencionaban, la cultura pura. Entonces, eso es muy importante que lo tengamos siempre presente. which is very important to the indigenous um, tribes and belonging to a community, and we should give that up. Ijankishina hini karigiwina, ho chankra asha khangwi gixu chinga hingairina, naga maikatera asha Virginia snake bumenga hingairina, Hello, my name is Virginia Snake Bumen. I come from the Winnebago tribe in Nebraska, and I am here on behalf of Table Six. Um, so we we went over our questions. We we talked about almost all of them, and the main theme that we kept coming back to was culture. Um, not just in the sense of culture helps us just by being culture, but culture involves movement. It involves time with ourselves. It involves time with our community. It involves time with the earth. Um, we found all of these similarities. Um, we talked about foraging, about gardening, about doing these things with our elders, with our parents, with our grandparents. We talked about dancing at powwow as a form of movement, but not only as movement, but as a form of discipline, of finding patience and finding love for yourself and finding love and doing things that connect you to who you are, connect you to your identity. Um, we also talked about these trusted people in our lives and how a big part of that is our community members. We have to believe in ourselves, but we also have to believe in others. We have to find people who elevate us, um, people who encourage us and inspire us to be better, who want us to be better for ourselves. And then in that way, you can also help them. Um, and then we also talked about sleep. <laughs> um, sleep is also very necessary. It's a big part of our health without sleep. You know, we'd, we'd be running on empty all the time. But um, a big part of it was definitely movement. Movement is medicine. Um, there's power in movement. It's not just dancing either. It's also crafting the movement of your hands, of creating something and producing something beautiful to share with others. Um, and all of these things, they come together and they, they help for us, they help our mental health and they help us to, to be better people and to, to be happy and to be whole. Um, but yeah, thank you. Thank you all. Um, who contributed to this conversation, but also to our fellow leaders here as well for sharing your experiences and you know just making this a safe place for everybody. So thank you.
All right. Even though this topic was very heavy, and I am so grateful for everyone here sharing their thoughts about this topic because it is important to all of us to take a stand. Um, so with that being said, I would like to have Miracle Spotted Bear. She is from the Ogallala, Lakota, Pine Ridge, South Dakota. She is going to come here and um, sing a prayer song for all of us. So give it up for Miracle Spotted Bear. <laughs> Free Palestine. I want to thank uh, Miracle for that prayer song. Now I'd like to uh, turn over to Rose Potowski from the White House uh, Office of Intergovernmental Affairs. So wonderful to see you all here. I'm a Kamei Webinesikwe Indigenous Kas Mashika Indodam. My name is Rose Potoski. My Anishinaabe name is Northern Thunder Woman. I'm Turtle Clan. I'm a member of the Grand Traverse Band of Ottawa and Chippewa Indians. And I am about a week and a half into being the Director of Tribal Affairs for the Office of Intergovernmental Affairs at the White House. <laughs> As we close out our day, I want to say chi miigwech. Thank you so much for sharing your ideas and experiences with us today. Not too long ago, I was like many of you, coming to DC for the first time, learning how to live away from my reservation and community, scared but also hopeful for whatever the future might hold. I grew up on my reservation in northern Michigan, a small uh, place called Peshawar Town, until I was about 18. I was a quiet and reserved kid, and in many ways I still am. But I've worked hard to get to where I am today. And I'm here to tell you that you can too. In Anishinaabe culture, we have a word called minimbaadziwen. And today we've been talking a lot about how our communities drive us to do the things we do. Loosely translated, minimbaadziwen means the good life. 
but what it really means is a way of living for your community, defining yourself through the acts of service you provide and where you fit in the greater makeup of your community. Many of the people in this room have been my mentors. Let's have a round of applause for all of our mentors. Where would we be without the people who were here before us? These people are my community here in DC, my Minimawadzawin here in DC, and many of them are standing in the back there <laughs> at the table. And I wouldn't be here without, um, I wouldn't be here without them. By being here today, you have uplifted your community, and I know you will continue to work hard. You have made your relatives and your ancestors proud. On behalf of the Biden-Harris administration, I want to say again, Chi Miigwech, thank you so much for being here. And thank you so much to our wonderful staff and volunteers who have made all of this possible. Round of applause for our staff and volunteers. Again, Chi Miigwech, thank you so much for making the trip here, for joining us, for sharing your ideas, and for being advocates for your communities. Thank you. Thank you, Rose, for your closing remarks. Now I'd like to turn the floor over to Caleb Dash, Seneca Jackson, Evelyn Enos, Junior Pancock, Summer Lopez, and Hunter Nish to, for, to do a, a song to close us out. And after that, please stick around. We're going to do a gro group photo. So don't go anywhere. Thank you. Hello. Oh. Um, good day, everyone. Uh, I know everyone's tired, and I know you guys had a long day. And um, uh, I was asked to come, I was requested to come and share a song, and the um, girls here were going to dance. <coughs> and just to have like a closing blessing, closing prayer for everything that you've all done, everything that, everything that everyone's done here up to this point to be able to be able to sit where you're at now and representing each of all of our own individual communities and just a little bit about the songs and the dances is that we dance and we sing for prayers we dance and sing for blessings <coughs> for all these different things you know for our homes our communities our people those those who are here those who have passed on and to those of the future and with this dawn, with this dance the flower this dance is done by the women and you know, as women, they hold that balance for all of us. They hold that balance for us men, for whenever we need to take care of the things that we need to take care of, and for when the women need to take care of the things that they need to take care of. And so, again, I want to share. I just wanted to share just that little bit with all of you, and um, I hope all of you have a good rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank 
So just to share uh, one more with all of you, um, we're going to be doing a social dance. And the social dance is for um, anyone and everyone. Everyone's welcome to come out and join. Um, we do ask that we keep it uh, co-ed, boy, girl, boy, girl. And because of that, when we have the dances like that, it's to hold that balance between the men and the women. Because in order to you know thrive together as communities, we all had to be on equal standing. We all had to be um, together as one. We had to be unified in that way. And so I just wanted to share uh, just one more social with all of you tonight. And again, thank you for um, having me here and be able to have this event. And again, this is um, <coughs> an invitation for anyone and everyone. Thank you. Good 